vlog 249. One more to shoot here in Reno before heading down to Vegas for the big 250, a trip that was booked a year ago. My dad and I, assuming the San Francisco 49ers would make Super Bowl 58 in Vegas, and we wanted to be there and enjoy the festivities for a couple of days. Also going to enjoy a Vegas Golden Knights game against an unbeatable, apparently, Edmonton Oilers team. Thanks to Scott Bean, hooked me up with the tickets to that. But damn, am I fired up, obviously, given the fact that the 49ers appeared like they were close to drawing debt. By the way, what kind of price would you have needed to bet on the notion that the 49ers would, at any point when they were down 24-7, have a 10-point lead in the game, which they did? with three minutes to go, thanks to some below average coaching from Dan Campbell of the Lions and the 49ers really turning things on in the second half. It's like in the first half, they were like, you know, what if we just make sure to have every one of our defenders just get blocked on every single running play? Let's just run to a spot and get blocked. It was insane. And it's crazy just how good that Lions offense is top to bottom. I mean, when you have David Montgomery, Jameer Gibbs, and Jamison Williams all gashing you out of the backfield with the Monroe St. Brown and Sam Laporta there to throw the ball to, it's like, what can you stop? I know the Niners offense is almost equally loaded, but that Lions offense is pretty much second to none if you're looking at it from top to bottom in the NFL. And I can't lie, and I kind of alluded to this a little bit on the last vlog, when the Niners came and pulled off this comeback to go to their eighth Super Bowl, part of me felt bad for Lions fans, because they've never been. And they do deserve to get there at some point. But man, as a Niner fan, it's hard not to be absolutely fired up. Super Bowl 54 was a game they should have won, if you ask uh, all of us. And now they have the opportunity for revenge against the Chiefs, which we'll be talking about. Also, by the way, I liked how uh, we had three consecutive commenters write in Quoting E40. Bang, bang, Niner gang. Well, as a sports fan, there's absolutely no better feeling than to have your team in the Super Bowl. And there's one thing that you can guarantee. If the 49ers win this game, you are going to want to come to Reno and to play in the poker game against me. Now, why is that? Because these things have a way of balancing themselves out. So if my hockey team wins the Stanley Cup, and my football team wins the Lombardi Trophy in the same year, I am going to run so freaking bad at poker that you're probably going to want to come take some of my money. Also speaking of the San Francisco 49ers, shout out to Brandon Ayuk. The catch being called by some, the fluke to Ayuk. I compared it to Lynn Swan's catch in Super Bowl X. A lot of people didn't get that reference, but if you're an NFL films junkie like me, you do. Brandon and I, by the way, went to the same high school. Shout out to the McQueen Lancers, baby. Anyway, this was a day in which I was coming off a session in which I was getting my ass kicked all day until I ended up raising pocket nines, flopping a set on 9-10 queen. My opponent would call a check raise and then call my all in when a 10 hit the turn. And with 1800 in the pot, the river was another nine, giving me quads. He acknowledged that I had the best hand anyway, but it was still fun to improve even more. On this day, I'd show up at 11 a.m., walk past Michelangelo's David, and buy in for $1,500. First hand of note would come 20 minutes in. I would have definitely mucked Jack-10 offsuit in late position when a winning player would raise under the gun, but given the fact that two action players called on my right, I was sucked in. The big blind would also complete, and with 150 in the pot, we go five ways to queen, seven, eight, two clubs. And no one bets. Which was fortunate, because the turn would come a slightly above average card for me. Big blind bets out for 60, and the player on my right calls. One of these two guys is very tough to get money out of. And the other, well, anyway, let's just say I raised to 150 here, obviously hoping they both stick around. To my amazement, it goes the opposite of what I would have hoped. The big blind calls and the low jack doesn't. 
With 450 in, the river is a beautiful three of diamonds. Wanting to ensure this entire range pays off here, and re-emphasizing that this guy is very tough to get money out of, I figured a half pot size bet was actually going to be too much here. So I just make it 180. Turns out that what I just said probably wasn't true because he had a bigger hand than I initially would have thought. He calls quickly, creating an $810 pot, and I win against Pocket Eights, who wasn't happy that no one bet the flop. But as they say, you can only check raids when your opponent bets. I lose back $70 trying to bluff a guy off ace high to no avail, which leads us to this hand. If you're familiar with the classic Green Day tune Chump off the Dookie album, now 30 years old, there's a part of that song that goes, Strange how you've become my biggest enemy, and I've never even seen your face. Now, over the past few months, in the absence of others, if the term enemy simply meant villain in a poker hand, not an actual enemy because this guy is like the nicest guy ever, then every single part of that lyric applies to this guy and this situation. <laughs> you might have to think that one through. Anyway, he plays short stacked and shoves extremely wide. It's kind of his thing. So when he proceeded to jam his $285 stack from the cutoff over two players, and I looked down at, once again on this video, pocket nines, he was going to get action from me. When I asked him what he had, he said, only a pocket pair. In my mind, that meant I was good. But in this $660 pot, he would turn over jacks. The good news was I would improve to a full house eventually. The bad news was he would improve to a bigger one. And after a good start, I was back to my starting stack. That hand was followed up by me flopping a king and ending up on the turn with 80% of a royal flush as well. But per usual, I would completely brick the river on a hand in which I really should have just semi-bluffed the turn but made the mistake of just calling. This is a mid-session update. If I was looking for ways to argue how the 49ers can win this game, I would look at total offensive output. When you look at recent history, the Chiefs have generally averaged a lot more points than they have this year. Back in 2018, 35 points per game. What a beast. Oh my God, that team was. But then you have 28, 29, 28, and 29. This year, look at this. They're down to an average of 21 points per game. Has their defense improved? Yes, it has. But still, that is significant. The 49ers are averaging right around what the Chiefs used to average the last four years at about 29 points per game. So when you look at that, they should have a bit of an edge. Of course, if I were to argue the other way, the Chiefs have one of the greatest players quarterbacking them of all time, and the 49ers have Brock Purdy. And then it folds to me, middle position two, and once again, I have Wayne Gretzky. I make it 35 here, and it folds to the button who had just sat down. He's a rich OMC who I know very well. As you can see, he likes to stack his green chips on top of his red chips in an odd fashion. He's my only caller with 75 in, and the board would come out four of diamonds, six of diamonds, jack of clubs. I bet 40. He grabs two of those oddly stacked green chips and puts them on small stacks of red chips and slides them in for the good old min rates. The good news is, this player is pretty much always going to slow play his sets, especially against me. I can basically rule that out. I've been playing against him since 2010. So I think I have a pretty good idea the range I'm up against in this spot. Namely, top pair hands and the occasional big draw. I three bet this flop to $240 here. This should accomplish a couple of things. It sets up the possibility of me to be able to barrel him off a jack if he doesn't fold it right now. And if he does have a big draw, well, I still have the best hand and I can build the pot up with such. 
but obviously I'm doing this as a bluff, trying to take the pot down. He doesn't take too long and calls my flop raise. With 555 in, the turn pairs the four. So I would give this some thought. This is one of those situations where I felt I had to decide what I was going to do on the river before I did anything on the turn with $900 left in front of me and him obviously having me covered. And what I decided on was I'm going to bet this turn card. And if I get a clean river, I'm going to bet my entire stack. And that should get him off of Jack X of diamonds. Because when he min raises the flop, I really feel like, like pair plus flush draw hands are going to be the most likely thing. I bet 300. Once again, in the typical fashion of this player, he does not take too long with any decision and calls. So with 1155 in the pot, the river is the eight of hearts. So if he has a diamond draw, it hasn't gotten there. And if he has a jack, I have to get him to lay it down. I have just about 600 left in my stack, and I bet it all. As I just mentioned, this player almost never thinks for more than a second or two about any decision. It's, I think, just kind of one of his principles. He doesn't believe, like a lot of OMCs, that you should ever do that. They get grumpy when any player decides to think through a decision, so they don't ever want to do it themselves. I'm sure you've seen that. But in this case, despite the fact that this is only a half pot size bet, he really starts thinking about this. And I'm obviously thinking to myself, damn, he's going to see through this. And he's going to find a call with Ace Jack of Diamonds here. He thinks for a few seconds before finally starting to stack chips together. After he did that, I knew I was fucked. He holds them in his hand for a few more seconds and then puts them in, creating a $2,400 pot. I show my hand, knowing it's no good, but not knowing what he was going to turn over. Five seven of diamonds for the rivered straight. A massive knit roll. It's a hand of poker that will go down in history for me. Out of all the failed bluffs that I've ever tried, I don't think I've ever been more confident in one working that didn't than this one. I've also never been so stunned by a hand that tank called me on the river when I make an all-in bluff as I was in this instance. He calls with a draw, hits his draw, hits the one of the most beautiful cards in the deck so I couldn't be overflushing him, and he still is worried that I have a full house and is somehow going to fold this hand, which is never going to occur. So I don't think this was the worst bluff ever. It just happened that I was going to be completely screwed if an offsuit three or an offsuit eight came on the river. And sure enough, one did. It was a situation that I would have liked to rebuy in, but I was out of time as I had to go pick up my son and take him to a dentist appointment. So I had no choice to call this halftime on the vlog and book the loss. All right, a $1,500 loss. I'm gonna try and come back here tomorrow night and get at least one or two more interesting hands for this vlog. All right, it is part two of this two-part vlog. Obviously, I drove away from the pepper mill yesterday, not feeling all that happy. But I did have one of those moments that was just fun in life where you got really cheered up because I had to leave early to go take my son to a dentist appointment. And I walked into his preschool to get him at the perfect timing, right as he was waking up from a nap. And he had this big smile on his face when I was there at a surprisingly early time. And he kind of ran over to me and he couldn't have been better. He was just phenomenal for the dentist. I was afraid there'd be a tantrum thrown <laughs> or something along those lines, but he, is, he was just great because I have an amazing son. Um, so that part of the day was great. I can't help but continue to think about this hand though. Obviously we're going to get a lot of people that say, oh Ben, you punted off your entire stack, you're an idiot. And you're entitled to whatever opinion you like. But the guy tanked longer than he ever tanks. 
because again, with a lot of these OMC types, they are men of principles. Uh, they do not believe in thinking more than two seconds about any decision. That's just part of their thing. So when he thought that long for a half pot size bet, after he hit his hand, I think it's an indication that it's a pretty good play. I mean, obviously he knew what he was gonna do if he hit his straight flush, but he seemed to have no clue what he was gonna do if anything else hit. And obviously if he had had the Jack X of diamonds, which I thought was the most likely scenario, he snap folds to my river bet. So all in all, I don't think it was the worst play I've ever made. Let's head back into Pepperell and try to make some better plays. But I'll be honest, as I head into Peppermill now, you're probably not gonna see me bluff tonight. Sometimes I feel like all is lost, but I know it's not true. I wanna put up all my walls, cause I'm not in the mood. But then I cut myself off from the rest of the room. I know that God can heal it all if you're patient and so It may not be the most common thing to hear from a poker player, but these days I usually don't play past seven o'clock at night too often. That's usually because I'm either taking care of my son, or, as is more common on Friday, spending time with my girlfriend. She's actually down in Vegas, hanging out with some friends. Ironically, four days before I'm going to head to Vegas. Let's uh, check in on her. never gets cheated out of a Vegas trip, that's for sure. As for my night, I would sit down in the third 5-10 game on table 10, and I'd get dealt aces under the gun, making it 35, and would get two callers. With 105 in the pot, the board would come out 8-9 deuce, two clubs, and I bet 60. The button is my only caller in this spot, so with 225 in, the turn is an off-suit 3. Good spot for me to keep betting. I'm making 125. Given this opponent, I liked my chances of getting called, but unfortunately, that does not take place. Under the gun limps in the next hand, and I have aces again, this time in the low jack and make it 35. Button calls, big blind calls, and the limper does as well. So we got four in the pot with 140 in there, with the board coming out 10, 7, 6, rainbow. I bet 50. The only player to fold is the one that you can see from my seat six vantage point. So with two callers and 290 in, we go to the turn, which comes the five of diamonds. Big blind checks again, and it's on me. I did not love this spot against two opponents, and one of them that rarely gives me much action. So I bet 80, and both call again. So with 450 in, the river is the three of diamonds, and now the big blind is done checking. This time he fires out for 200 and under the gun folds. The fact that he's betting into two opponents makes me believe that one pair is simply never going to be good here. He has 500 behind, and I haven't covered. Calling is just not going to be a winning play here, I think hardly ever against this guy. But could I jam with the nut blocker here. I thought about it, and in hindsight, it probably would have worked. But I'm just gonna be honest with you, I was still a little gun shy to jam as a bluff after what had happened to me the day before. So I decided to simply muck the aces here and move on. After playing two hands with aces, I then played two hands with eights, one of which I'd make a club flush on the river when my opponent bet 35, I'd pay him off, but he showed pocket nines with the nine of clubs, but did say he likes watching me on YouTube. All right, I have a question for you. Matt, Raina can get on on this too, perhaps. Fabulous. Tell so, this, so uh, you guys are going maroon today, I noticed. Yes. It's like maroon, yeah. maroon Friday. <laughs> but I feel like a week from now, we need to have a coordinated effort. Ooh. Because the San Francisco 49ers are in the Super Bowl, and they're wearing white. So I feel like we need, like, white with a tinge of niner red 
a week from today. Can we pull this off? Is that a, is that a thing? Hundred percent. Well, it would be if I was rooting for the Niners, but Do what? I don't know yet. Oh. <laughs> but for Ben, we have to. Uh, maybe. Maybe I'll see you what don't I can even wrestle care. up. <laughs> I don't. I don't. <laughs> I can hear the demons call when they do what they do And now I feel like taking off, find a place with a view The pain is never gonna stop if it's controlling you I know the, the second time around with the hand that has traditionally been my favorite over the years Comes when we get two limps and I make it 50 Cut off, calls, as does one other so with 165 in, I flop an over pair on 7-3-deuce rainbow and bet 65. The cutoff is a guy who's been known to give a lot of action. Not as much to me as he gives to others, but a lot of action nonetheless, and he raises to 200, and the other player goes out. It felt like one of those spots that could almost go either way. Tough to lay down an over pair against this opponent, so I would make the call. And with 565 in, the turn is the eight of clubs. I decide to go for the check raise here. And sure enough, he comes out and bets another 200. Generally speaking, when they bet the same amount on one street as they had the previous street, your opponents aren't going to be super strong. So with that in mind, I did not raise all that much. I just make it 475 here with 700 behind. And he doesn't take too long with it. And calls. So with 1,515 in, the river is not going to do me any favors. It is the ace of clubs. Now, I don't even have a half pot sized bet left, but I still didn't think I should bet my entire stack. So I decided to leave myself 200 and just bet 500 here, about a third of the pot. I've long held the theory that regardless of how much money is in the pot, when you're playing in these $5 blind or $10 blind games, a $500 bet is always a huge bet, regardless of the pot. And it was pretty clear that at that point, he became convinced that his one pair was no good and tossed it into the muck. Fortunately for that opponent, he wouldn't make about 150 back from me when I raised pocket jacks, and he called me with 7-5 offsuit and made three sevens. We then get the alarm going off. I actually think that's what happens if a dealer shorts the time rake by five bucks. Anyway, I'd make another $185 three betting pocket kings and getting action before a fold to my $200 bet on 10 6 3 two clubs. So this rare late Friday night session was an interesting one. There were three games going on and they were all decent, but I actually figured the game on table one would be the best game. So I would table change over there. I'd actually win a handoff of Reno Grinder, which is a rare occurrence, when I would flop top two, when I would call the raise with ace five of diamonds and flop top two pair with it. But that was really the only hand that I'd win at the game because it was one of those situations where I'd been on the move list for a while, and once I finally got into the game, it wasn't nearly as good as it had been. So I'd play at that table for about another 45 minutes without any real hands of note before racking up and booking the win. All right, about 10 o'clock at night, wrapping up part two of this two session vlog here at Peppermill. Able to book a $710 win. So winning just about half of what I dusted off back yesterday as we head to Vegas next week. Say hi to your fans. Hey fans.